Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hey guys, Dr. Santosh here, pediatric infectious disease doc and researcher. And it is just one week until we appear (laughs) at the Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo. That's two C's, two E's, C2, E2. (laughs) And Josh, I've always wanted to say this. Sunday, 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 because <laughs> we're presenting on Sunday, on April Fools, yeah. no less. It will be yeah. April, and we and we're a couple of fools. But the Wait, presentation is real. I thought we were on April second, aren't we? On the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Oh shoot! April Fools! I got the day wrong. Yeah. You are correct. Yeah. It is Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it was Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I, I want everybody come Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Well, if you haven't purchased tickets to C2E2, no worries. You can get them at the door. And there are prizes to be won. If you stump <laughs> the chump with a comic book <laughs> medical question. Yes. Or possibly if you want a prize. <laughs> or if you just want a prize. <laughs> if, you just, if you say to us, <laughs> can we have that? Yes, yeah. So Josh, it is a loc- it's the room is S four oh three A from two fifteen to three fifteen PM. Uh and yeah, we're we're so excited. It's Sunday 4 2 2023. Cause if you're listening to this in the future, uh it will have already happened. But you know, you can go back in the past if you've invented a time machine to that time and place in Chicago. In which case, hi time travelers. Either way, some of you folks may have noticed last week, I may, I might have possibly put up a rerun because preparing for a live show is a little bit more involved than my usual uh, prep work. Yeah, and, you know, nerve-wracking um, because we fear humans. No, that's not right. What was the other reason? <laughs> Editing is <Gosh>. harder. <laughs> 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 Yeah, the editing. All the- anyway, <laughs> it is an alternate week. In fact, it's the first alternate week we've had in almost a month. <laughs> Any of you nerds out there who are cap- keeping track of which weeks are the alternate weeks, um, it's you, you have wasted your time and effort. I'm just it's whatever right week now. we say it is. It's a week <laughs> where I have alternated yeah. off writing a regular one because sometimes yeah. reading through medical journals is not only fun, but easier. It's it's some of the best times and my favorite part of doctoring. One of my favorite parts of doctoring is learning new things. Absolutely. Well, then, do I have a surprise for you? Because this week we're going to focus <laughs> on some unexpected findings in our alternate Ooh. week because it is time once again for everybody's favorite non-comic book related medicine segment. Yay! Journal Club! Ah! Yay! (laughs) Kermit Arms? Kermit Arms? Kermit Arms? Kermit Arms? Kermit Arms. I may even do them for real. You can finally see them. IRL. (laughs) Listening audience. It's actually really dramatic because Josh is boneless. No, that's not true. (laughs) My bonitis! (laughs) <laughs> actually it would be like because bonitis would be inflammation of the bone this would be like a bone a bonophilia or something like that i got a no bone that would be love you. love of lack of bones but <laughs> i don't know what it is but yeah. anyway santosh yeah. i don't yes. know how you react to being anxious but a lot of people will have gastrointestinal side effects of one of two varieties either your nerves make you poop or your nerves make you not poop yeah this is part of our fight or flight response right and it's kind of maladaptive in today's 
world, right? This is this is millennia and m actually millions of years of mammalian evolution, where if you have anxiety, which usually is linked to, oh, a predator is going to try and kill me. You either want to just jettison chow, like you just want to boom, drop everything and be able to run, like because you're naked, or you want the nerves and blood supply shut down to your gut so that you can supply blood to your heart, lungs, brain, and limbs, and you can run away, fight, or flight. So that's fa that's fantastic when you're hunting and gathering, you know, out on the plains and you're worried about a lion running you down. Not so helpful if you've got stage fright. So in our first story, we're going to talk a little bit about constipation and specifically a Yay! unexpected finding for a solution. <laughs> well, we hope. We hope it'll be a solution. But Josh, unlike with will will this Will this include one of your favorite quantitative scales of all time, the Bristol Stool Scale at all? You better believe it will. <laughs> we haven't talked about Bristol! it for, I don't know. We haven't talked about it for like, what, a couple months? Yeah, I mean, you must be like holding it in all this time and you must be full to bursting. <laughs> so you know what? Before we get into the main story, let's just, let's take a quick a quick side yeah. trip. I mean, just get it all out. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, I'm sure a lot of you have seen at the doctor's office the chart for pain with all the happy faces. But did you know we also have a chart ranking poop? <laughs> well, not ranking, but yeah, like a like a rating. Oh, that doesn't sound better. <laughs> we we have numbers. It is for called <laughs> It is called yeah. the Bristol stool chart or stool scale. Yes. I uh -huh. encourage you. It is very safe for work, if a little odd <laughs> to have in your search history. And if you go look it up, there are seven types of poo. A few of these we're not really going to focus on for the purposes of this story, but I'll just briefly cover them. Type seven, watery, no solid pieces, entirely liquid. Type six, fluffy with ragged edges, a mushy <laughs> stool. Yes. Type 5, soft blobs with clear-cut edges. Type 4, like a sausage or snake, smooth and soft. <laughs> 4 is what we yes. consider most commonly in the normal range. Then we start getting yes. into the constipation ones. Type 3, like a sausage, but with cracks on the surface. Type <laughs> yeah. 2, sausage-shaped, but lumpy. And type yeah, 1, like... separate hard lumps like nuts. Hard to pass. <laughs> so next time it. you have but, a movement, take a look. Yes. See what see where yeah. on the chart your poo ranks. So everything comes down to poo, uh, Josh. If I am if I remember my medical training and certainly yours as well. It's, I, I love this and I know you love this because you don't have to mess around with subjective, you know, hey, what was your stool like? Did it look like this? Was it like this? You can just shout out a number. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Try it next time you're home. Hey, honey, what kind of poo today? Four. <laughs> One. Yeah. And then you celebrate because four is awesome. All right. Digression aside. Chronic yes. constipation, poops one through three, is thought to affect about 16% <laughs> of people in the United States. Yes. Unlike with other digestive diseases, like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, chronic idiopathic constipation, meaning constipation where we don't actually know the cause, it just kind of happens, is characterized by difficult, infrequent, or incomplete bowel movements without any obvious reason for disease yeah so what if usually this is treated with things like laxatives and stool softeners and various changes to diet but what if santosh you could take not just a pill to help your constipation but a vibrating pill <laughs> i would say you're on the wrong podcast, Josh. <laughs> nope, nope. I think, You're going to shake it, maybe... shake it, shake, shake it, shake it. <laughs> the, you're uh, okay. 
we're, this is a therapeutic thing we're talking about. Like you're, you're actually, you're, you're not just like, we're not segueing or changing our format or trying to attract a different type of an audience at this moment. No, this is a <laughs> medical treatment. It's a vibrating pill for okay. constipation <laughs> that is meant okay. in theory to stimulate nerve cells in the gut called mechanosensory cells. Uh, okay. Those cells kind of act as your, they're almost like the brain in your gut. They, they help yes. tell the gut, start these peristaltic waves, waves that advance food in your gut from one section to the next. And mm -hmm. before you ask the obvious question, they are not suppositories. Inserting a vibrating suppository pill would be a terrible party game. <laughs> uh, no, these pills from, as, as reported by the chief marketing officer of Vibrant Gastro, Ben Feldman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I love the name. I don't know if they can ever make anything else. That's the only problem. <laughs> Usually you want to make a company and you want to have like multiple products if you're a medical device product. <laughs> but I just, yeah. Listen, it, if you do it, one thing, do it well. Do it well. So yeah, absolutely. The pills are meant to be taken by mouth and mm -hmm. before sleep for five nights a week. Now, they they suggest you do three days on, one day off, two days mm -hmm. on, one day off. Uh you have to activate the capsules before use with a little pod that comes with them. So I don't know. It's like swallowing AirPods. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of questions that come well, up. Yeah, it's so it it looks like a little pill, and then it comes in a little charging cradle, like you know you know, <laughs> you put your like uh, AirPods if you use that or any kind of like Bluetooth things. You put it in the little charging case. It comes in the. <laughs> Then you activate it with your after, phone <laughs> after the capsule is activated. And I can't uh -huh. wait till this makes its way to TikTok. After the you capsule is activated, the app, like you have the, the find my and the buzzy app on your phone. What if where's you my butt? You accidentally, like you set your phone down and you hit it by accident like in the middle of dinner no 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 not like you're trying to have your salad and maybe you're out on a nice date and then all of a sudden you just start <laughs> Sorry. okay first first as funny as that is to imagine <laughs> Yeah, okay. You will not okay. be able to hear this pill vibrating when it's doing its work inside you. Are you okay. getting a call? No, it's just my gut. <laughs> the capsules come in a pod. You activate it. After you activate a capsule, you immediately swallow it with a glass of water. Once yeah. it's swallowed, it will remain on and shaking in the body for two hours. It'll then turn itself off for six hours, and then it'll turn itself back on again for another two, all without you having to operate any kind of apps on your phone. You just need to activate it. It'll take care of itself. Yeah. And in this particular case, while it's going on and off, it's transiting its, its way through your digestive system. So down through the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then I guess you retrieve it uh, the old fashioned way. Well, it's not dissimilar from what we have seen making its way into the GI world in the last few years, which are capsule endoscopies, which are pills oh, okay. that you swallow and have little cameras in them so they can reach areas that you can't reach with a traditional colonoscopy or endoscopy. The only right. difference is this particular pill doesn't have any cameras. Your bowel privacy is safe. It's just there <laughs> yes. to shake whatever constipation loose yes and they did a small phase three study now for those of you playing along at home phase three human testing yes um, and not only that josh but um it, it you've all you've already passed safety standards and this is a true like fda approved phase three 
device study. So you've passed one and two, which is largely for safety. And now you're actually looking at efficacy. So in a small phase three study that involved about 300 patients who had chronic idiopathic constipation or functional constipation, researchers found that taking Vibrant led to one additional bowel movement in about 40% of patients who took the vibrating pill compared to 23% of people who were in the control arm. Okay. About another 23% of people had two additional bowel movements per week. So one additional per day, two additional per week compared to just 12% of people in the control. Which Wonderful. Okay. Is good. It's functional. Yeah. I don't no, know no. that it's I don't know that it's a well, huge change. It's um, not, so this is uh, I think Josh this is going to have to be like a cost effective analysis problem. If you ask anybody with chronic or functional constipation, you'll they'll tell you right away any relief that you can provide them is a godsend. Like even if it's just like this, like you're improving their bowel health a little bit, especially if the side effect profile is really low. Now, these pills, you're supposed to poop them out just like a pill cam. You're not supposed to try and retrieve the pill or anything like Please that. Please don't it's, try it and retrieve it. Yeah. <laughs> it goes down into the toilet. It's done. It's done. There is no recharging the battery or anything like that. There so is, however, you... a LoJack system, and that's what the app is for. <laughs> so you can track the capsule while it's in your oh, body. Yes. So it doesn't and, – and the reason, as funny as it sounds, the reason is so if you have little out pouchings – in your intestine yes. that are known as diverticula, you can tell yes. if it gets caught in there because that might require retrieval. Right. Yeah. And that's, and usually that's okay because by and large, those diverticula are in the colon. Um, so it can be reached by, by colonoscopy to retrieve it out. But essentially, Josh, if you say that like, okay, I need to be on this kind of a device therapy for a while, as long as the cost of those individual pills is okay, such that the average person can afford to have, you know, a X number of them and then, you know, use them one at a time so that you're not breaking the bank to use this, then that's actually not so bad. And I'm guessing that you should use this in conjunction with the other treatment that you have for your constipation. So this isn't like a standalone. No, but also people who have chronic constipation are probably already on several different things. So it's unlikely that you can just pop down to the corner store and say, I'd like one of those vibrating belly pills, please. Uh, now, <laughs> yeah. now, while other people around you will not know that you are shaking like a bowl full of jelly, <laughs> a small minority of patients did state that they could feel the vibrations while the pill was traveling through their system. Although importantly, none of them felt it was uncomfortable and none of them needed to drop out of the trial or stop taking it. They just happened to say, Oh, you know what? Feels like my uh, colon's getting a call <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> from mother nature. When nature calls, <laughs> you put yeah, it on yeah. vibrate. And, <laughs> and I think that it, this is nothing that is all that unusual if you think about how therapeutic touch and massage works for things like musculoskeletal problems. And so, you know, when we have physical therapy and massage therapy for people who have chronic pain, you know, in their muscle tight, you know, there are some folks where you have crossover with other pain syndromes like fibromyalgia with constipation or even psychiatric syndromes like uh, anxiety and depression where likewise massage and touch therapy can help. This is just a, you know, more inside kind of a massage. And just like you're stimulating the tissues to loosen up and, you know, kind of get warm and get blood flow with massage, this does it from the inside where you really can't reach your hands normally to give it a nice, you know, squeeze in a, and a thing. <laughs> so, it's pretty <laughs> ambitious hand reaching. 
So yeah. <laughs> it has received FDA clearance for use in adults with constipation who do not get relief from laxatives after a month. Um, and in case you're wondering, it's about $89 a month, which is a little bit more expensive than other over-the-counter options. Oh, okay. Interestingly, it also counts because it's a drug-free treatment option. It's not actually pharmaceutical. It's classified as a medical device, which means it requires special controls to ensure their safe use. Uh, other class two medical devices are contact lenses and pregnancy test kits. So we're not talking about, you know, heightened training special controls, but you do need to be taught how to use this. Sure, sure. It it still is a medical device. And, you know, Josh, we'll, we'll tell people as a, for instance, even something as simple as using a crutch, getting out of the hospital, a lot of the time we'll have someone with physical therapy come in and at least show you for a bit how to use this thing where we're telling people to put something in their body, usually the, the same way. There's some degree of education that's needed before you use it because I, I hate to say it, but you know, if there's some dumb way that someone's going to find a way to like break this thing and use it improperly, <laughs> it's going to happen. So we can hopefully anticipate those and, you know, nip that in the bud so that it's <laughs> nip that in the where? Well, uh, bud, B U D. Don't, don't. <laughs> 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 Next, next story. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. No, no, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so, excited about this. This is beautiful. I next... hope, I hope this does really well and actually spawns off, you know, other technology that can. It's a simple solution for that can a, vibrate. A really There's technology. a lot of things you can solve with vibrations. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I'm talking about ultrasound, people. Yes. Uh, so let's go. move on. <laughs> let's move on to our next story in space. Woo! Actually, this is really fascinating. Less so for astronauts, but this was a primary school in Canada that discovered a pretty important fact about space medication. Oh, Santos, okay, very nice. Yeah, you are familiar, of course, with. An EpiPen. Yes. I, I don't have personal experience, but we are pediatricians after all. And so we do see a lot of food allergies as well as environmental allergies. And this is one of these devices which is meant to quickly and safely deliver epinephrine without any kind of super special training so that you can very quickly rescue someone who's dying after exposure to an allergen and their throat is literally closing up and they can't breathe. So for those of you who have not experienced EpiPens before, it is a device that automatically injects a dose of epinephrine which is like the mm -hmm. adrenaline, the fight or flight response hormone into your body to overcome yeah. the effects of life-threatening allergic reactions. So let's say perhaps that you're an astronaut wandering around doing a moonwalk, maybe doing some, <laughs> uh, some space station stuff, or you're just working in a lab on the International Space Station. And sure. turns out oh, wait, you were now, unaware. Now you're not on the moon though, because like the... Well, oh, you're doing one of these things. Look, look, look. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. You're an astronaut doing work in space. Got Who am I to judge okay. what your what your job is? <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And you suddenly learn, much to your surprise and subsequently horror, that you are yeah. allergic to space dust. Yeah. Oh, oh, so of course, oh, God. Okay, yeah. So, of course, you're responsible. You brought an EpiPen with you. NASA had you prepared for this. So you open okay. your EpiPen and you take a dose. Well, oh. turns out epinephrine becomes a toxin as soon as it enters space. What? <laughs> what? What do you? So you're talking about when it's in the pen. So, so what, before you inject it, a team okay. of elementary school students in Canada. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay, all right, yeah, yeah. Sent 
pure epinephrine as well as EpiPen epinephrine solution to okay. space in two small NASA cubes. Uh, NASA opened up the opportunity for a lot of different schools and private individuals to conduct their own experiments on the space station, provided that these experiments could fit into a small cube. Oh, I remember this. I remember this. So, well, so it kind of served multiple purposes. One was to see the the use of these you know, small packing cubes and to see if they were practical. That was for NASA. And then they wanted to encourage science. So anything that you wanted to do was like, hey, take this to space and use it. Or in this particular case, this was just, hey, take this to space and see what happens. Yeah. So they decided, let's just send epinephrine up to space and see what happens. So the students sent yeah. pure epinephrine and EpiPen epinephrine uh, in two cubes, one on a rocket, the other on a space balloon. Okay. When the cubes, <laughs> when the cubes returned to Earth, they were sent to All a right. lab to test if the chemicals inside them went through any changes. Uh, okay. Great, great school experiment. Let's put something in space, see what happens. Sure. About eighty-seven percent of the total epinephrine was still pure and usable. But 13%, a number which I think you'll agree is much too high, of yeah, the sample yeah. had turned into highly toxic benzoic acid derivatives. Oh, boy. And that, by the way, and so epi, as we said, here on Earth, you take the epi pen, you basically just flip this cap off and you stab it into your thigh. Like you can go through denim jeans with this thing and it's it's fine it'll get to your muscle and then into your bloodstream but benzoic acid not only toxic and so you don't want to inject that but that would sting and hurt like a mother if 10 percent of this has turned toxic that might pose a problem quite a lot of things in space because yeah yeah epinephrine is a rather <laughs> important medication uh, yeah yeah i don't really have any follow-ups for this? I just thought it was <laughs> fascinating, and presumably no. NASA's now working, because NASA didn't even know about this. They had to be taught yeah. by school children that this yeah, yeah. vital medication is no longer valid or needs <laughs> some kind of tweaking. It, yes, absolutely. So more than likely, Josh, this is going to be a storage problem. So uh, uh, let me kind of put it together here, because I, I, I think I understand the rationale so you know just as you said these were kids who are actually they're from ottawa so they're from u ottawa elementary school so these are not older kids either these are elementary school students so you see epi pens in use a lot more in the pediatric population rather than in the adult population because of allergies to things like shellfish peanuts and you need to have the epi pens on you and with you in a place like school because you could you know just be going along and then little sally tibby joey whatever uh encounters that food that they're allergic to without knowing because, you know, they can't keep track of every darn thing. And then boom, they need to use their EpiPen right away. So the kids actually recognize this much more quicker as, hey, this is an emergency, emergency life-saving device and product. So what if you send up an allergic astronaut and they need to use this the thought hadn't even crossed the mind because right now in the astronaut core the way it is is there are a little things which will disqualify you from being an astronaut and having a life-threatening allergy takes you pretty far down on the list so <laughs> there was really no reason to test this so far but if we're going to be sending lots of people to space including civilians not just you know government people then absolutely we're going to need to know about this we don't know why this happened this was really just an observational kind of a trial but it was a genius simple test just send this to space leave it there for a little while bring it back tell me if it's okay <laughs> so unexpected good. finding unexpected oh my god now for our last story before we present at c2e2 which is of yes. course a family friendly uh setting we, yes 
there 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 is family friendly and family unfriendly in, in C2E2, but we're going to be family friendly. Or we're, we're offering a family not. friendly show. Yes, or evidently, if I don't, then or if you swear don't, jar, then there's swear jar. Yeah, <laughs> swear jar. <laughs> yeah. So let's get this out of the way early on with our last sure. story. Don't be a dick. Santosh, <laughs> researchers at Stanford University have uh-huh. some good news and some bad news all in the same package. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this I, I think this depends on I, I think this depends on what you're trying to achieve in life at the time. <laughs> so is that fair? Is that I think that's a good way to put it, right? Men in the audience. I've got some news for you. In a study yeah. published on Valentine's Day, no less, yeah, over yeah. the last 30 years, the average erect penis length has increased, increased by 25% globally. That's yeah. right. <laughs> all, of, all of humankind's penises have been getting longer over the yeah. last 30 years. Yeah, but, so gl- globally doesn't mean around the penis. It means around the, around the world. Around, around the, world. the world. Penises yeah. are getting longer all over the place. But <laughs> this phallic enhancement yeah. is unfortunately correlated with what appears to be a steep decline in sperm counts and testosterone levels. Right now, Josh, I think there is a select group of our audience that are cheering their asses off (laughs) absolutely ecstatic about this uh maybe between the ages of i don't know 80 to 29 18 to 29 something like that (laughs) we get bigger penises and a lower chance of impregnating a person a study so let's let's talk about these studies A study led by Professor Haggai Levine of Hebrew University of Jerusalem found that over the last five decades, sperm counts have halved. From 1963 to 2018, sperm counts have been dropping by about 1% on average per year. But from 2000 to 2018, the decline increased to 2% per year. Not a lot for any individual and certainly over a lifetime, but over the human race, dropping sperm counts, of course, could lead to some reproductive issues. How did they determine that these sperm counts were dropping and that penis length was increasing? The researchers didn't get their hands dirty, (laughs) but they scoured the scientific literature and looked at 75 different studies between 1942 and 2021 that involved over 55,000 men. I want everyone out here to understand that implication. That means that there were, and by the way, these were these were selected studies out of. I thought you were going to say selected penises. No, no. <laughs> out of many other. I want everyone out there to know how many scientists are out there for one reason or another, penis measuring. Okay, because this was historical, like this is metadata. This is the world's (laughs) biggest dick measuring contest. (laughs) And everybody wins or everybody loses, depending on how you look at it. It's it's metadata because they're they're mining data that has already been you know <laughs> has already been acquired, but I just want you to know that at least seventy five investigative teams in that time span have been measuring penises. <laughs> Since this, the is end of war, long, gosh, this is as long. This is this is as long. <laughs> We defeated the Nazis and started measuring penises. And started growing penises. That's that's yeah. what defeating Nazis gets you, a bigger yeah. penis. Yeah. This has been Sorry. going on I'm... as long as the Weapon X program in comics. That's how it's like, oh, 1942, yeah. huh? Um, so for those of you curious, the length that it's been increasing from, because everyone's like, well, what's an average length? What's an average length? We have to know. I shouldn't tell you because I don't want to start creating anxiety in people, but it's scientific. 
So yes, erect yes. penile length on average has been increasing over the last 30 years from 4.8 inches to 6 inches. Okay, okay. Now, Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler took it to the next level, and he conducted a study on over 15,000 men to create a chart of the average penis size today. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just got real quiet. No, no, I, I sorry. I just I got real thought. quiet as everyone <laughs> runs to the other room to grab a ruler or a tape measure. <laughs> oh, oh God. Should, <laughs> should we pause in case the, uh, our audience didn't hit pause before they dropped their phone and although before there, they there is and a dropped trout. Yeah. <laughs> there is a possibility that, you know, some percentage of our very tech savvy audience actually opened up the measure app on their phone. Um, yeah, I, I, I do want to let everybody know just, uh, you know, number one, please protect your privacy, turn off all of your like cellular data and Wi Fi before you do this so that you don't accidentally hit send on any of these. And number two, it's really important to measure erect penis length because non-erect penis length has no correlation across the board at all so oh don't it, worry it, i've got numbers i've got numbers yeah. for you of all sorts <laughs> but okay but okay. i would just like to put forward i know people are going to want to share these yes we uh -huh. don't want well we don't want any photos nobody wants photos of penises no 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 one yes, no one not even yes. urologists yeah nobody <laughs> wants them but yes. if you want to send us the numbers. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Anonymously. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Anonymous. Yes. Please do not yeah. identify. I don't need to be thinking yeah. about that during my work day. So yeah, just make a throwaway study, account. It'll be fine. <laughs> so Dr. Morgenthaler conducted a study, a survey. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt on sure. over 15,000 men and found the average length during erection is 5.16 inches or 13.12 centimeters for our metric friends. Yeah. And the average flaccid penis length is 3.6 inches or 9.16 centimeters. Now, okay. it's not just okay. about length because remember, we're already longer than people 30 years ago. Let's talk okay. about girth. The average oh, oh, value... Okay. The average value for girth when erect is 4.59 inches or 11.66 centimeters okay. and 3.66 inches or 9.31 centimeters when flaccid. So sure. what makes this interesting means if your penis is 11 centimeters, then you're in what's considered from this study, the low 10%, but just four centimeters longer puts you in the high 15%, which is a pretty big okay. jump for such a small difference, ha -ha. Yeah, yeah. which and, seems to uh, indicate yeah. <laughs> that yeah. most penises, regardless of where on earth you are or how you're measuring, are rather similar in size. Yeah. Um, for anybody out there, like if you don't have your ruler or more likely your tape measure, <laughs> and you want to know what a centimeter is, the average, just about on average, index finger the width of that from side to side uh at, at at its um you know near the tip of your index finger is about a centimeter okay so you know the difference in length between what's considered like on the shorter end and the longer end is actually not that much at all so as part of this study they asked all the men how long do you think the average length of an erect penis is sure and it turns out most people think that it's great that it's six inches or greater which we have just oh. <laughs> objectively proved is false give it another 30 years yeah, yeah. <laughs> if things continue to trend in this direction yes <laughs> like a hundred <laughs> years from now we'll all be walking around as tripods with like no <laughs> sperm count we'll have bred ourselves out of existence <laughs> so but we'll be hung like <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, men are weird. So, <laughs> so there you go. There are there are three unexpected findings for you. Uh, we do have about 
five to ten minutes. So, Santosh, why don't you tell me about uh, how we bred alcoholic mice, and we'll close out with uh, that yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this, it's a little bit of an unexpected finding, but not too much. This was in the journal Cell uh, Metabolism. Excuse me. And uh, the wonderful authors over here, Dr. Uh, Miwa Choi et al., gave us a little bit of an insight on, Josh, what makes you drunk? Alcohol, Santosh. That's very (laughs) easy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So here's kind of the weird thing. So animals out in the wild actually do get wasted as well because they they're not trying to like make wine and tequila and all that kind of a thing either but what they do is they can eat fermented fruits and nectar and the sugars are broken down by you know natural bacteria and yeast in the environment to alcohol compounds right and so the animals in the wild along with us we have actually evolved mechanisms to sober ourselves up if given enough time. And this is also why if you eat like fermented fruits and vegetables and, you know, you're out a hunter gatherer and you get a little drunk off of them, but if you do it too fast, our body has natural defenses like vomiting and throwing up to get rid of it because you've overrun your detoxification system, uh, which is no good. (laughs) But in the meanwhile, very, very interestingly, right? We actually found that there is a hormone that's induced by drinking ethanol, which is the, the form of alcohol, which we drink. And it's called FGF 21. Okay, so this is a growth factor that we make, and it's actually made in our liver. And what happens is our body senses ethanol through various, uh, you know, hormonal pathways. And then FGF1 is actually induced. So we start to make more of it and ethanol induces it very, very, very quickly. And FGF1 actually, you know, it, it gets us to do many things, but it actually makes us drink water. So we get thirsty and we want to prevent dehydration. And you have to remember, Josh, all of this was evolved before we just had alcohol in a glass, right? So right now, again, it's maladaptive to have a glass of alcohol because then you just drink that because you're feeling thirsty and it, it makes you worse. But you also, you know, you get a little bit more sober uh, because you actually, you know, also stimulates um, the the formation of norepinephrine, noradrenaline in the locus ceruleus in the in your brain stem. Okay, and that turns up your sympathetic uh, nervous system, and so you kind of sober up. So your body is actively trying to keep you sober while you are drinking. You got it. Got it. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so this is the cutest little alcohol study ever. So they made mice (laughs) which were deficient in FGF1, uh, FGF21. So they bred mice that didn't have the anti alcohol hormone. (laughs) We genetically engineered easier to drunk mice (laughs) basically okay so that now you have to use the teeniest little pipette and you give five grams per kilogram of ethanol by gavage so you just give a little bloop bloop (laughs) you kind of put it in and then what you do is you take the mouse josh and you just flip them over onto their back (laughs) what a mouse is supposed to do because a mouse does not like being on their back because that's where it's vulnerable and it's going to die. And then the mouse is supposed to kick, kick, and then flips itself over. That's called a writing reflex, R-I-G-H-T. So it's, it's writing itself. So basically there were a couple of other, you know, studies that they did to actually show 
FGF21 binding to the neurons in your brain, and then whether or not the mice could actually make FGF1 or not. But they just fed the, the little alcohol to the FGF deficient mice, and then the normal mice, and they just flipped them over and they said, okay, mouse, get back, get back on your feet. Get <laughs> the ones that go home, you're yeah. drunk. Yeah, <laughs> the ones that had the FGF twenty one knocked out the the gene to make it, they they were just kind of ah, <laughs> they could they couldn't flip their mouse over, and and, and the the ones that had normal FGF twenty one secretion, they could flip themselves back over and they you know walk away and all that kind of thing, and they went on to study the effect of FGF twenty one on the actual neurons in the brain. They did other studies to actually like uh, examine the uh, the brain itself by pathology and fluorescent studies and all this kind of a thing. But it's my favorite little finding where you just you feed some alcohol to a little mouse and then you just you flip them over. <laughs> you basically have to sit there with a little stopwatch as a come on mouse, come on flick. <laughs> flailing <laughs> i can't i'm too drunk i don't have the get sober hormone <laughs> ah, oh, the cutest little so, experiment ah. from, so from vibrating constipation pills to growing penises space poison and drunk mice i think we yes. found some pretty unexpected studies this week <laughs> <laughs> And oh, if you'd so like cute. to hear more of this in a slightly, and I emphasize slightly, more family-friendly format, please yes. come see us this upcoming week at CTE2. We will do everything we can to get some live version of the show recorded and back out to all of you out there in internet land uh, for those of you who can't make the show. Or... You know we will always do our end of season Comic Con uh, medicine podcast in July. Uh, but if you can oh, yeah. make it to this one, please do come say hi. Uh, I have a special prize for you if you come up and you uh, mention the podcast. It is blatantly, you know, self promoting, and but it, it is also very, very cute. And um, it's to shut. It's to just say we love you. And thank you so much for supporting us and listening. Uh, we we appreciate every last one of you, however you're listening and uh, and appreciating our, our content. So that's it for this week. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. The show is produced by me with a lot of help from Dr. Santosh and friends. Aww, our theme music you. is composed by Rachel Leisure. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are in the show notes, along with links for further reading. You can also support us on ACAST Plus, which will start getting a lot more use with extra bonus materials soon, as long as I'm done editing this talk <laughs> any day now. Yes. And uh, until next time, keep a song in your heart, soap on your hands, a passport in your pocket, shots in your arm, and then get yourself out to come check out our live show. Have I promoted it Woo! enough? See 2 e 2 Come check us uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, where can they go? See 2 e 2 All right, I'm done. <laughs> Bye, guys. We'll see you next week. April 2nd, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs>